Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to this uh, special election um, interactive session. Uh, my name is Brian Nick from the U.S. Embassy uh, Office of Public Affairs in Brussels. And I'm very pleased uh, that you are able to join us tonight. Um, and I'll just say a few words before how this will proceed. Uh, in a few minutes, I will, a few seconds, actually, I will introduce uh, Dr. Paul Sarasic from uh, Youngstown State University in Ohio. Uh, he will speak for around 25 to 30 minutes, and then we will open it to your Please feel free to send any questions in the chat pod uh, that you'll see on your screen. Um, and then um, I or one of my colleagues will then pass those questions on to Dr. Sarasic. Um, so with that, Without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Paul Sarasic, who is the, the PhD in political science and currently chairs the Department of Politics and International Relations at Youngstown State University in Ohio. Um, Dr. Sarasic articles on American and Ohio politics has appeared in the Washington Post, USA Today, The Diplomat, Bloomberg View, CNN, and The Atlantic. Um, Dr. Sarasic is also a former two-time uh, Fulbright scholar to Japan where he taught American politics. And without further ado, I'd like to pass that on to uh, Dr. Sarasic. Um, Paul, over to you. Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, <clears throat> and welcome um, to this brief overview of you know, this very exciting election that's going on um, in the United States. We've got a little less than a, than a week left. And I'm just gonna try to hit some kind of basic points about it, um, things you might be interested in, and then I'm happy to entertain your questions um, when I'm finished. Um, and I'm having, there we go. Um, so first, some background. Um, we have been um, dealing with this election um, in the United States for a very long time. Um, it seems like forever. Um, we are basically, you know, on a, uh, a two-year election cycle um, in the United States. So this started way back, really in January or February of 2019, and it's not really going to end, um, you know, officially until you know January of 2021. Um, so it's a very long process. Now we're most of the way through it now, but the most exciting parts are yet to come. I know most of you have some background in American politics, so you recognize um, this screen. This is the US, you know, of course, um, electoral map. Um, each state is assigned a certain number of electors based on how many members they have in the House of Representatives plus senators. So I am from the state of Ohio. Um, if you look there, I don't know if my pointer comes up on your screen, but if it does, you can see it's sort of in the in the right hand um, upper side of it uh, near the upper Midwest, we have 18 electoral votes because we have 16 members of the House of Representatives and two senators. Um, for virtually every state, um, the assignment of electors. Um, someone needs to be muted. Um, uh, anyway, each state is, is roughly winner take all. Um, there's a couple exceptions to this. And what that means is that whoever wins the state wins all the electoral votes. What the candidates are trying to do, if they think of this as kind of a puzzle, right? You're trying to put the pieces together and each piece has a different value. And you're trying to put it together so that it equals 270, the absolute majority of electoral votes you need to become the president. And we do it on a state by state basis. As you probably also know, um, the pieces to the puzzle, um, they're not all available, right? Um, <clears throat> that, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, the pieces, some of them we know about um, ahead of time. A lot of them we know ahead of time. In fact, most of the states, we already know how the election will turn out. But I can make a bold prediction right now that California will give its 55 electoral votes to Joe Biden. Um, you know, we know that before we even run the election. In most states, we know how it's going to turn out. Those states that you see there that aren't, um, you know, colored in either red or blue, red for the Republicans and blue for the Democrats. 
Um, those are the states that are important and will decide the election. So this election is really taking place in some ways only in those states um, because they're the competitive states. Now we get surprised every election um, or every other election where some states which we think are not competitive, it turned out were competitive. Um, and we think they're, you know, they're definitely in the Republican column or the Democratic column and they switch over. Um, we do get surprises. This year, the big conversation is about Texas, um, which we often assume is a red state, a Republican state. Um, but there are some arguments, and there were arguments in 2016. Hillary Clinton spent some money campaigning in Texas, um, thinking that that will flip um, to the Democratic Party. Um, but until that happens, we're kind of leaving it as a locked Republican state because um, up until now, it always votes Republican. And of course, if you look at the state level, state offices are virtually all Republican still in Texas. In 2016, um, when President Trump won the election, um, he did it right by winning or running the table, one might say, with the swing states. Almost all those states that were undecided ended up going for the Republican Party. The only exceptions on this map would really be Nevada and Colorado over there um, to the left. Um, those states um, <clears throat> went for Hillary Clinton. But the big um, win for Trump was in the upper right of the map there that you see. Um, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Um, no one prior to the election expected President Trump to win all of those states. And that's why he not only won the Electoral College vote, but he won with a comfortable margin. Um, he only needed 270 and he received 306. So as we look at this election this year, that's where we're really focused on, um, the upper Midwest, those voters. And it, there's not a lot of voters. Um, those states are sort of moderate population states. They're not our highest population states. And in fact, they're states that are losing population. And in fact, if you look, you know, we're taking a census now in the United States, we're counting our people for the purposes of apportioning out or portioning out the members of the House of Representatives, which are based on population. And we expect, for example, that Ohio will lose a seat in Congress because of our relative decline in population. And we're actually not declining, but we're declining relative to other states. All the growth is really in the southern part of the United States, um, not in the northern part. But still, those states have enough of a population, that means they have enough electoral votes that they make the difference. <clears throat> you might have heard a lot of controversy in the United States about how we're voting this time. And of course, because of COVID, um, we're kind of being creative. You know, in, traditionally in the United States, um, you go and vote on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. And that's the way we've been doing it forever and voting was largely in person. Um, there were some exceptions. You could vote absentee if you weren't gonna be in the state at the time or if you're gonna be you know, out of the country at the time. But pretty much everyone showed up on election day. Really over the past 10 years or so, that's becoming modified. It's become modified. We've gone to what's called no fault absentee voting. And what we mean by that is that you don't have to make an excuse. You don't have to say, well, I can't show up to vote in person because I'm going to be out of the country or out of the state. You simply say, I don't want to show up that day. Um, I'm going to be absent, please mail me a ballot. And you'll be mailed a ballot, ballot um, you vote and you mail that back in or you can drop it off in person, which is kind of odd because you just said you were gonna be absent. Um, but still, you know, we do that. And that's been very common by the way in Ohio for a long time now, for several elections, we've been vote, able to vote that way. Um, I actually voted that way this time, um, absentee. I'm not going to show up on election day. The controversy though, isn't absentee ballots. We've been doing that for a long time. The controversy is over what we call sort of mail-in ballots. Now absentee ballots are mailed in, but they're not automatically mailed to you, right? You have to um, ask for the absentee ballots and you have to give some sort of identification, for example, um, your social security number, which is kind of our national pension system. Um, it's an identifier and you have to use that to secure the absentee ballot. But some states are going to um, simply mailing ballots to everybody in the state and they can then be returned. 
And that's where really the security questions come in because there's not a verification at the beginning that the person who's being mailed a ballot is actually there. Um, however, I don't think that's gonna be a controversy after the election because if you look here, the states that are actually doing mail-in balloting, almost none of them, um, with the exception of Nevada and Colorado, are considered swing states, right? Yes, they're doing mail-in voting in California, but it doesn't matter. They're doing it in the District of Columbia, in New Jersey. All of those states we know will vote Democratic. Um, so I don't think that's gonna be the big controversy, even though we've been talking a lot about it in the United States. Let's talk a little bit about the sort of issues and the voters um, that I think are going to be important, particularly in the upper Midwest of the country. This phrase, all politics is local, is a phrase you often hear um, in the United States. It's attributed to Tip O'Neill, who's that gray haired gentleman in the picture there on the right, um, a longtime politician from Massachusetts. He served as Speaker of the House. Um, and you see a picture there with him with Ronald Reagan. Um, that's the good old days in American politics when Republicans and Democrats could laugh together. Um, they actually were both sort of old, um, you know, Irish Americans who had a lot in common, even though they differed in their political parties. But Tip O'Neill was famous for saying all politics is local, that even if you're serving in Washington, D.C., the issues are different and they're local. And if you're going to win re-election, you need to understand that you have to serve um, the local people. And in, you know, if we're looking at politics of the upper Midwest and the presidential election, you, know, you need to realize that even if an issue isn't important nationally, if it's important in the upper Midwest in one of those swing states, um, then it's going to affect the election. <clears throat> I'm gonna be very local here um, and talk to you a lot about Ohio and the Youngstown, Ohio, where I am from, because it's somewhat symbolic for the entire region of the upper Midwest. Um, one of the big swings in 2016 was in this area around Youngstown that had been extremely democratic. We would say, you know, if we say blue is the color of the Democratic Party, it was a dark blue area. The Republican Party basically did not exist in the Youngstown area. Um, they could not win any offices. And the reason was um, labor and the importance of organized labor that backed the Democratic Party. Of course, we saw this area swing towards the Republicans, not completely, um, but um, you know, very strongly towards Trump in 2016 and the Republicans, which kind of stunned everybody. So I wanna talk about that area, but that swing in the Youngstown area was mirrored in states like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, um, which made the big difference in 2016. Black Monday, September 19th, 1977. Um, a long time ago, but it's the date that everyone remembers in this area because on that day, um, one of the big steel companies announced they would be closing on Friday. So they announced on Monday that on Friday, 5,000 people would be out of work. Um, and over the next 10 years, 50,000 people in this area would lose their jobs in the steel industry. Um, and it scarred the psyche of the area. Um, and it's still an important element in politics. It made people oppose trade and international trade. Um, they blamed the loss of their jobs on foreign competition. Um, and there was some truth to it. Um, what had happened, of course, after World War II, um, the mills in Europe and Asia, um, Japan had been destroyed and the rebuilt mills were very efficient. Um, they could produce steel much more efficiently than the older U.S. plants that had not been destroyed um, during World War II. When the energy crisis hits in the 1970s, it becomes too expensive to produce American steel. Foreign steel becomes cheaper, and a lot of people in the upper Midwest, where they made the steel, lost their jobs. Um, Trump promised to reverse that, um, to bring the jobs back in the upper Midwest. That's why he did things like steel tariffs. Um, that was symbolic in the upper Midwest. Um, a lot of controversy about whether it's a, what its effect was, but that was an attempt to reach those voters in the upper Midwest. Voters in New York and California don't care about steel and they're not necessarily in favor of tariffs, but voters were in the upper Midwest. Um, here's the unemployment rate in Ohio and you can kind of see what happened. 
things got better um, after 2017, not radically better. They were already trending in a positive direction. But up until COVID hits, and you see that spike at the end in unemployment you know, um, after January and really in March, um, but prior to that, um, the unemployment rate was definitely trending in the right direction. And it was really the lowest that most of us had ever seen um, in this part of the country. <clears throat> now focusing just on the Youngstown area, it was a little more uneven you see here, but the trend was definitely in kind of a positive direction. Although you will also notice it was trending a little bit negative even before um, COVID hits in February or March of 2020. But overall, things were getting a little bit better um, in this area. One of the big local stories, and it's playing into this election, is the General Motors plant that's just north of Youngstown. Um, that closed um, in March um, a couple of years ago. Um, that was a big deal. It was a major employer, and one of the things that really hurt um, the unemployment numbers, it's one of the sort of the spikes that you saw on that prior graph. Uh, <clears throat> when the Lordstown facility closed, this is the local newspaper that, by the way, also closed. Um, and, you know, it called it a new Black Monday. So the idea was that with the GM plant closing, um, it was sort of paralleled to what had happened in 1977 back in the Youngstown area. And a lot of people argue that this is going to cost um, Republicans, President Trump votes um, in Ohio in 2020 as we go into this election. Um, on the other side of that, the other argument is though that President Trump actively campaigned to stop the closing of the plant. He tweeted out about it. And he did work um, to convince General Motors to actually build a battery plant in that area that will be coming in the coming years. Um, a Korean company is actually investing about $4 billion in the area. So again, it's kind of, you know, it, there's more than one side to the story. That's why we're really not sure how this is going to um, come out in 2020. <clears throat> one of the questions is who will vote? Right, we're probably going to get um, a very big turnout in 2020 because of all this early voting. Um, the numbers that we're seeing, the estimates are um, that we're going to have, you know, <clears throat> maybe 150, 160 million people vote, and we had about 137 million people vote in 2016. So that's a big increase. Um, you know, we could end up hitting some of the numbers that we saw really in the late 1960s where we were above 60% um, of voting eligible population. But of course, even with that, even if we have a great turnout, 65%, I mean, that means 35% of those who are eligible to vote will not vote. So it is still important to understand the election, who's going to vote, who is gonna be among that 65%. And that's what, what causes controversies, by the way, with polling, because when you're doing polling, you're modeling the electorate and you've got to figure out what the electorate is going to look like. Um, we did see, by the way, a record turnout in the midterm elections of 2018. But notice the big gap between midterm elections, which is what we had in 2018, and presidential elections, which is what we're having this year. So no matter what happened with the electorate in 2018, it's going to be a different electorate. Millions and tens of millions of more people are going to participate in 2018. 20 that did not participate in 2018. And how are they going to vote? Um, that's part of you know, the question, particularly, again, in those swing states. Uh, working class voters were very important to President Trump's victory in 2016. Um, are they going to show up in even greater numbers? And are they still going to support President Trump? Um, how do they feel about the tariffs? Are they a positive thing? Are they a negative thing? Because the tariffs help some industries, those that were protected, but they hurt other industries, those who depended on the imports um, that now had tariffs placed upon them and became more expensive. So you had job gains, you had job losses. How is that going to affect these working class voters in places like Ohio and Michigan and Wisconsin? Um, they have been trending um, Republican, right? Donald Trump sort of rode this wave that you can argue started in 2008 um, in the United States with working class voters. And that means um, 
white voters who don't have a college degree. That's what we talk about as sort of working class voters. Um, their incomes can vary tremendously, by the way, and their job prospects can vary tremendously. But we kind of lump them all together. And they were trending Republican before, um, and that continued uh, in 2016. We can talk, if you have questions about that, we can talk about it because it's not actually a completely even growth. Um, 16 was a little bit different than 12 and 8 when it came to these working class voters. <clears throat> demographics in the United States um, are changing demographics, particularly the increase in um, Hispanic voters, um, which is, of course, a category that we invented in the United States and brings together a lot of people from different parts of the world um, that we refer to as Hispanic. If you're Mexican American, you're Hispanic. If you're Cuban American, you're Hispanic. But Cuban Americans and Mexican Americans don't necessarily vote the same way. So putting them together can be a little bit um, deceptive. But you definitely um, you know, see an increase. Basically, the way to look at this map is sort of the darker the color, the more of an increase in Hispanic voters and a consequent decrease in, um, in white voters. It's not only Hispanic voters that are here, though. You, know, you would also be talking about sort of any voters of color who would be included um, in those areas, because the, the measurement here is the decrease in non-Hispanic um, white share of the vote. And of course, some of the states affected are Texas and Florida, which we consider, um, you know, Florida is a major swing state, arguably the most important swing state because of the large number of electoral votes it has. And Texas, of course, is this a reliably Republican state. If Hispanic voters are voting more Democratic, then that could swing the vote. And that's been expected for some years. It's dangerous doing this, by the way, because demographics don't always stay the same. Um, Irish voters, for example, for years were considered, Irish Americans were considered reliable Democratic voters. They're not at all anymore. Um, Catholic voters were considered reliable Democratic voters. They're not at all anymore. So these groups change over time um, as they are in the United States and, and of greater numbers. So it's dangerous saying um, demographics is destiny in politics. Also, you have the problem of turnout. Um, even though you're getting an increasing Hispanic population, um, the turnout numbers are very low compared to white voters and compared to African-American voters, which you can see in this, in this chart. Um, you know, African-American voters, I think, are going to be, and Hispanic voters, are going to be very interesting in this election. Um, you know, both turnout and direction of vote, because we've seen several polls recently which shows that President Trump is doing better among African-Americans than one would expect, and that historically has been the case for Republican candidates. Now, overwhelmingly, African-Americans are going to vote for Joe Biden, for the Democratic candidate. But, you know, African-Americans are the most reliable um, Democratic sort of voting demographic. And if even, you know, you see a five or seven percent change in support among African-American voters, that can have a huge impact, um, particularly in some of these swing states where African-American voters are going to be, you know, 12 or 13 percent um, of the vote in these states. Young voters. Um, we always talk about that in the United States and in every election we always expect young voters to suddenly get interested and show up, right? They're always outvoted um, by older voters. Well, one of the things we're seeing now is that these young voters who didn't vote when they were 18 are still not voting very much um, as they age. In, in the past, one of the things you noticed, right, is that even though you had very low voting, you know, let's say the, the so-called Generation Xers, um, they started to sort of catch up a little bit, but millennials don't seem to be catching up. So we're wondering about the, the youth vote. We are seeing some evidence in early voting that young people are voting in maybe larger numbers than before. But it'll be a really interesting thing to look at after the election. Did young voters finally show up because every election is predicted that they will, um, but whether they actually do is another question. Of course, we're not just voting for president in 2020, we're also voting for Congress. Um, and a particular interest is the United States Senate. As you may know under our system, the two branches are not exactly equal, right? The Senate can do things like voting on treaties, um, approving nominees to the US Supreme Court, that the House of Representatives can't do. Also, we're relatively sure that Democrats will retain control 
of the House of Representatives in 2020. Um, we're not sure what's going to happen in the U.S. Senate. Republicans currently hold a slim majority in the Senate. Even though Republicans didn't do well in 2018, they actually increased their majority in the Senate. And that's in part because we only vote for one third of the Senate every um, two years. And the one third of the senators, they serve for six year terms, but the one third that were available or were up for election in 2018 happened to be overwhelmingly Democrats. Um, so even though Democrats did fairly well in the Senate elections, um, the Republicans actually managed to gain a couple seats in 2018, and they now hold a 53-47 majority. So for um, Democrats to take over the Senate, um, they would have to gain um, at least three seats. Now that is if they win the presidency, because the vice president is the tiebreaker in the Senate. If they don't win the presidency, they would have to win four seats. Um, and that's really five seats because one of the seats is in Alabama, and the Democratic win in Alabama um, was kind of accidental. And it's not a Democratic state at all. It's because of who the Republican nominee was. Um, that's not the case now. There's a very popular Republican nominee in the state of Alabama, a former college football coach. And if you know anything about the United States, you know there is nothing more important in Alabama than college football. And Tommy Tuberville is the Republican candidate. He is the former coach of Auburn that went undefeated a few years ago. So he became basically a saint in the state of Alabama. Um, he is virtually sure to win that race. And that means that's a net one loss for the Democrats. So really looking at it realistically, they have to pick up four or five seats in order to gain a majority in the Senate. Um, anyway, I've been trying to keep this under a half hour. Um, hopefully I'm close to that now. I will stop and take your questions. Just a reminder that it's not over on election day, November 3rd, um, we're gonna be counting. Um, if it's close, um, we're gonna be counting for weeks, probably afterwards. It varies state by state. We can talk about this also. One of the things to understand about the United States is elections are state affairs, not national affairs. It's different in every state. In Ohio, we'll, we will be counting absentee ballots for 10 days. In Pennsylvania, they will be counting absentee ballots for three days. Um, so if it doesn't come in by three days, you're not voting in Pennsylvania. You have 10 days in Ohio. It's different from state to state. If it's close, we'll be counting for a while. Um, the next important date after November 3rd is actually December 14th. Technically, that's when we actually vote for president because all those electors who are being elected on November 3rd will go to their state capitals and cast their votes on December 14th. We need to know by the 14th, by the way, who won um, in these states. So it's very close and we have contests We've got a narrow window between November 3rd and December 14th to sort this out um, because the electors have to go to the state capitol to cast their votes. Those are then mailed to Washington, D.C., not really mailed, but you know, sent to Washington, D.C., where they are actually counted on January 6th, I'm sorry, by the new um, Congress that will come in on January 3rd, and we'll have our presidential inauguration on January 20th. Um, with that, I'll stop and take your questions. Thank you for your attention. Paul, oh, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, Brad McGuire. I'm a colleague of uh, Brian Dix here at the embassy. I'm the deputy public affairs officer. Um, wonderful to hear what you had to say there. And I think I might go ahead now and moderate the, the question and answer period, if that's okay. So uh, we have a couple of questions coming in. I'm gonna start with one on the electoral college, if you don't mind. Sure. Can you kind of, cause it's such a mystery to many Americans, let alone Belgians um, or Europeans. Can you talk about a little bit about what the framers original purpose was in the Electoral College and do any of those purposes that they were trying to meet, are those still relevant today? Or is it just an anachronism that we can't get rid of? Well, I mean, the original um, you know, argument at the Constitutional Convention, we're writing the Constitution. Um, the idea of having the people vote directly for president was dismissed. Um, because uh, the comparison was having someone um, who had, was visually impaired um, have a, what they called a trial of colors, meaning able to pick out colors. They said it wasn't a matter of the fact that someone wasn't um, intelligent enough to make that choice. But if you're visually impaired, you can't pick colors because you can't see colors. Um, so you wouldn't have the information. And it was thought in 1787 when we're writing the Constitution 
that the average person would not have enough information, would not even have any idea who the best national politician would be to be president. So it wouldn't make any sense to give them the vote. What they really wanted, and this is not, you know, will not sound strange to you in Europe, is kind of a parliamentary system. Um, and what they really wanted over and over again is Congress to elect the president. And if you just count votes at the Constitutional Convention, they voted for congressional election of the president more than they voted for anything else. But the reason they didn't want to do that is, you know, we didn't want a Westminster system um, in the United States. You didn't want a link between the president or prime minister and the legislature. Um, they were arguing for what we would call separation of powers, checks and balances. They wanted the president and Congress to basically fight with each other or at least watch over each other. And if Congress elected the president, then the president would serve Congress. And they didn't want that. They were afraid of Congress. They wanted the president to stop Congress. So they needed to have that break between Congress and the president. They essentially invent a one day Congress. That's what the electoral college is. It's basically a mirror of Congress. It's a one day Congress that does nothing but vote for president and then goes away. And by the way, it says in the constitution that you cannot be a member of Congress and be an elector. It has to be a separate group. Um, so that's why we have this system. It really isn't that complicated if you simply think of it as a congressional election. Now we've made it um, sort of less small d democratic because we go, the states have decided to choose winner take all systems for electing electors. Um, and so what that means is that everyone who votes for the losing candidate in a state, it's as if they didn't vote um, because their votes don't count. So, um, you know, millions of people might vote for the losing candidate in Texas and their votes don't count. Whereas the same number of voters in Ohio um, who vote for the winning candidate, they do count, right? So it, it, that's why it skews it. If we actually went to sort of uh, distributing electoral votes, maybe according to um, proportionality in the states, we could probably have an electoral college and a matching with the popular vote. Um, it wasn't really seen as a problem for most elections because it was very unusual for the popular vote to go one way and the electoral vote to go a different way. Um, of course, in 2000, that's what happened, and in 2016, so we're sort of talking about changing the system. Very, very difficult, though, to change it because you would have to amend the Constitution, and amending the Constitution takes super majorities in the United States. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I apologize if there are any audio or video problems with this. We're, we're just uh, working with the technology we have, and it's a bit new to all of us still. We have a, a, a ton of questions out here, Paul, so I'll go with the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, why does the president claim that it, is, that it is illegal that votes should still be counted after election day? And is that true? Well, um, again, every state has their own laws and can come up for the, with, on the, by themselves with how long they're gonna count votes. Um, nobody's counting votes necessarily that were cast after election day. The real question is, a, a vote that's cast before election day, but is mailed. And because of a delay in the mail, it doesn't arrive until afterwards. And that's sort of the big controversy. It, it, it's a little bit complicated, but on the legal side, um, the way the US Supreme Court is looking at it, it kind of depends on who's trying to move the election, whether it's illegal or not. For example, if the state decides as a state, hey, we want to allow more days, um, that's fine with the Supreme Court. But what has happened in some states um, is that you have a court, for example, Wisconsin is getting some attention now because you have to have a federal court that has ordered an extension of days because of COVID. And that's where the Supreme Court is basically saying, no, a, a court can't change the rules because under the constitution, the legislature is in charge of, the constitution actually says appointing electors. One of the, the little known facts including among Americans, is that our constitution actually doesn't call for presidential elections at all. Um, mm -hmm. It allows state legislatures to appoint electors in whatever manner they choose. They have chosen elections, but the Supreme Court says that that means they have total control over that. They get to decide. The situation in Pennsylvania recently was a little bit different. It comes to the Supreme Court, but you had a state Supreme Court, um, which basically tried to extend the time and the Supreme Court said they weren't going to second guess what a state Supreme Court has done. 
It's a little complicated. That could come back before the Supreme Court. The court actually tied four to four in their original review of the Pennsylvania matter. Um, that's when we had a vacancy on the Supreme Court. We no longer have a vacancy. Amy Coney Barrett has now been put on the Supreme Court. So it's possible for that case to come back um, before the court. But we kind of throw around the terms legal and illegal um, to go back to the question a little bit loosely. And what I'm trying to explain to you is how the courts actually look on this. Okay. Good. Uh, we have another question from another participant. It's a two-parter. The first part is, are the polls in the United States more reliable this election year than they were last time? That's part one. The second part is, what happens if there is a tie, if they both get 269 votes? Then what happens? Who will decide? Uh, th this could take me the remainder of our time um, <laughs> to answer these two questions. And I think for the first one, I'd appreciate it if we had audio difficulty. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, the polls, uh, big question, right? Because in 2016, um, the state level polls were clearly wrong. Um, the national polls, if you average them out, they got pretty close to the actual result of the popular vote. But it was the popular vote within each state, particularly the swing states, that were, that were wrong. There's no other way of saying it. The polls were wrong in Wisconsin. Um, they were wrong in Pennsylvania. Um, why were they wrong was the big question after 2016. And the answer um, from a lot of pollsters was they did not weight correctly for education. Um, meaning, you know, if you know anything about polling, you know, you don't just take the numbers, the responses you get and put them out there. Because if you know that the electorate is gonna say be 52% female and 48% male, and you've got 52% of males in your sample, you can't just put out that poll, you would weight the female voters more because you're trying to make, to model the electorate, to make the poll match up with the people who are actually going to vote, not just the people that responded to your poll. Um, and they didn't wait enough for education. They didn't realize how many voters would show up um, who didn't have a college degree. Um, and that's because people without a college degree are less likely to respond to polls. That is true and false. Um, when you really start to look at it, what you find is that some polls that did wait for education were still wrong. So if we are waiting for education now and think we've solved the problem, maybe we haven't. Um, and that is, by the way, what is panicking pollsters in this election. Um, there are two possible problems with the polls sort of beyond waiting. Um, the first is called non-response bias, meaning um, you may not know this, but people in the United States hate to respond to polls. And it's very easy to, to not respond um, because you, everyone has caller ID. So you see a number you don't recognize on your phone, you don't pick it up, you don't respond. Or you do pick up the call and it says, hey, we're from the New York Times um, and we're conducting a poll. And you, you know, if you're of a certain political orientation might say, I'm not talking to the New York Times. Um, and you, know, you hang up. So that's non-response bias. If everybody who's not answering is going to vote in a particular direction, let's say, um, it's particularly dangerous if it's within a demographic group that you're not, so you can't counterweight it um, because it doesn't matter. Let, let's say um, all African-American voters who are voting for Donald Trump are not responding to polls. Well, you can have the right number of African-Americans in your poll, um, but you're not picking up all those African-Americans who potentially are gonna vote for Donald Trump, let's say. And that can throw your vote off, non-response bias. Um, the other thing is called social desirability bias. Um, those are the shy Trump voters. And in Europe, right, you, you've heard of like the shy Tories, right, with the, with the Brexit vote. Um, you know, the fact that, that people are embarrassed to say that they're supporting Donald Trump or they feel it's dangerous to their careers or something to say that. So they lie to the pollsters. Um, that's social desirability bias. They say they're voting for one candidate when they're really voting for another. Um, there have been, there, there are actually different studies of this. Some say they don't really exist. Some say they do exist. Um, I'm sort of on the side that they probably do exist to a certain extent. I know shy Trump voters, for example. Um, it's actually one of the questions that I ask people. We're trying to figure out ways of getting around it. Um, and one of the ways you can do it is instead of asking people who they're voting for, you ask them who somebody else, their neighbor's voting for, um, or a family member. And that way they can tell the truth about them, but not about themselves. Um, I know we're limited in time here, but I can tell you a, a, a little anecdote on this, and that I had a Japanese diplomat in my class back in February, 
this was right before um, we closed down for COVID. And after he gave his presentation, he was curious. So he asked my students, how many of you are voting for Donald Trump? And maybe one raised their hand. Um, the whole class said, no, they were voting for Biden. Um, and I laughed a little bit. I said, let's change the question. And then I asked the class, how many of you have a close family member who's voting for Donald Trump? And everyone in the class raised their hand. Um, so, you know, that, that, that shows you that there may be something going on out there with these shy Trump voters, which makes us nervous a little bit about the polls. Um, so that's sort of the controversy about the polls. The tie question, um, very interesting. And if you see on election night, for example, Arizona and Wisconsin are going for Donald Trump and everything else is kind of going as expected. Um, maybe also Florida and Georgia, North Carolina are going for Donald Trump. Um, we might be heading for a tie in that situation. For example, you win, I think it's Wisconsin and you lose Pennsylvania if you're Trump and if you're really close to a tie vote. It's an even number of electors, um, right? So you can have a 269-269 tie. Um, by the way, there are two states that allocate their electors by congressional district as well as statewide. So that means you can win one vote in Maine and you can win one vote in Nebraska. In fact, Barack Obama did win one vote in Nebraska in 2008 um, in the area around Omaha, the sort of major city in Nebraska. Those voting there will become very, very important recounts there to find out who actually won that one vote could become very significant. Um, but if we have a tie, remember, we'll, we might know it on election night or the few nights after that. There is some time between election night and when the electors actually cast their vote in December. Could you have a faithless elector for example, somebody who is pledged to one candidate who moves in a different direction. Um, in the end though, if we actually have a real tie, meaning it's recorded as a tie, the constitution under the 12th amendment says it goes to the House of Representatives to determine who the president is. However, the House of Representatives votes by state, not by individual. So each state has a delegation. The majority of the delegation will determine the direction of that state. Even though the Democrats control the House of Representatives right now, the Republicans control one more state than the Democrats do. Um, so they actually have 26 states right now. So if the election went to the House, if all those states vote, um, if the Republican states vote for the Republican candidate, Donald Trump would win. However, um, it is not this Congress, this House of Representatives that would vote for president. It's the next one. Because remember those dates that I showed you earlier, January 6th, um, is when the tie would be recognized when the count was actually recorded. And the new Congress comes in on January 3rd. So we don't know what the breakdown will be by states. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one goes to some things I think people have been hearing in the news about potential, potentially contesting the results. And the question is, if the result is close, should we expect that the loser, uh, be it Biden or President Trump, uh, will um, sue or complain that there were false votes? Yes. Um, you know, I, I think we can be very, very confident of that. Now, what will be the grounds for this? Again, it's probably going to be some of the same things that we're arguing about right now, um, you know, which is, you know, what, what, who's counted in and who isn't. In Pennsylvania, for example, on mail-in ballots, it's the same way in Ohio, by the way, there are actually two envelopes. Um, you know, when I cast my vote by mail, um, there was one envelope that had identifying information on it about me um, that the ballot actually went in. But then that envelope goes in a second envelope that's anonymous. That's what people would actually see, you know, when I, the, the mail person would actually see when they, when they picked it up. So there's two envelopes. It's the same way in Pennsylvania. The rules for counting in Pennsylvania say that if you don't have both envelopes, the ballot isn't counted. Um, so if you just take your ballot, and, and the only way that would happen, by the way, it wouldn't be the identifying envelope, it would be the non-identifying envelope, the anonymous one. So you fill out your ballot and you put it in an envelope that's pre-addressed for the Board of Elections, but the other envelope that sort of identifies that you're a legitimate voter isn't included. We're calling that a naked ballot. And if it's a naked ballot, it doesn't get counted. And you know, voters aren't always really good at following instructions. And there's an estimate, for example, that 100,000 ballots could be cast in Pennsylvania that are naked ballots that won't be counted. If Pennsylvania is close and you have 100,000 ballots that aren't counted, somebody's going to go into court 
and contest that. And that is exactly the kind of case that probably will go all the way and very quickly to the US Supreme Court. Um, one of the big questions is, will Amy Coney Barrett, the most recent appointment to the court put there by President Trump, will she, quote unquote, recuse herself from these cases? Um, there are very good legal arguments that have been made on both sides, um, actually among two very prominent conservative jurists um, and lawyers saying that she should absolutely recuse herself and one saying that she shouldn't. Ultimately, it's going to be up to her because the way the Supreme Court works is even though there's rules on a recusal um, that is based, the individual justice is expected to decide for themselves whether or not to recuse. Okay. Uh, the next one is, uh, gives a bit, goes to a bit more historical context. Um, the question is, why do Americans vote on a Tuesday? And could it be a national holiday? And if it were, uh, do you think that would increase voter turnout? And would it matter? Well, you know, a bunch of, the first answer is because we were an agricultural country. Um, and so the reason we vote on Tuesdays is that was convenient um, for farmers who might have to travel a great distance. You know, we were a religious country. They probably were going to church on, on Sunday. Um, they couldn't make it to the, the, the capital or wherever to cast their vote by Monday. So you give them until Tuesday um, to sort of get there. That, that's the tradition. Um, it was to make actually voter it easier for people to vote, doing it on a Tuesday. Um, now, of course, we're not an agricultural you know, country like that anymore. Um, so there's no real reason why we vote on Tuesday. If we made Tuesday a national holiday, yeah, it probably would be easier for people. Um, they wouldn't have to go before or after work. But I will say that in a lot of states, for example, the state that I live in, we have made it so much easier to vote um, than it was even 10 years ago. That the idea that we have an election day that's in the middle of the week, therefore it makes it hard for everybody, is not as good an argument anymore. When, you know, in Ohio, for example, you can vote almost 30 days before the election um, when this starts. You know, you can vote by mail. You can vote what's called in-person absentee. So on most days um, during regular business hours and on weekends, you can show up at your local board of elections and you can actually cast your vote at that point. And, and in fact, you're probably seeing these lines in the United States because a lot of people are actually taking advantage of that at that point. And the reason that there are lines is because on election day, that's when we have all the polling places set up um, before that, we only have maybe one place that you can go vote before because we don't expect everybody to vote early because of COVID it's changed everything and they are voting early now. Um, it would probably make things easier if let's say we just had a Saturday and Sunday election um, or something like that. Um, you, you don't hear a lot of discussion of it, however, um, mm -hmm. of sort of changing election day. Instead, it seems that all the discussion is about mail-in voting and making it so people don't have to show up at all on election day. Okay. Uh, the next question, it, it kind of hits on a couple of things you've talked about already, but it really goes to the question of certainty. And the, the question is, when will we know for sure who is elected? And if you can't even say that, what, what would be your best guess if you were a betting man? When do you think we'll know with confidence? Um, I can't with confidence answer that question. You know, if it's, if it's not close, then we'll know on election night. Um, you know, in 2016, we basically knew by about 10 o'clock, uh, 11 o'clock, what was going to happen. Um, because even though it was close in some states, only about 45,000 votes in the state of Pennsylvania, for example, um, you know, because Trump won, had won so many states that he could lose one on a recount and still have become president. If that's the case on election night, then it will know on election night. Um, if it's very close, then we're probably going to be waiting. Um, at least a week, maybe longer. Um, I know I told you in, in Ohio, for example, um, we have 10 days to count the ballots. Um, so, you know, you're gonna wait at least 10 days if Ohio's close and if Ohio determines who the winner is, and you've gotta wait until all those ballots come in and then you've gotta count and maybe recount those. So it could take, you know, theoretically weeks if there are court cases challenging it, that could delay it even more. We had this situation back in 2000 right, where we went weeks and weeks, we went well into December, um, and we still weren't sure who the president would be. Now, we survived that in 2000. We would survive it again. There are procedures for doing this along the way. 
Um, the real, real problem and the thing that we're hoping to avoid in 2020 is a close election where there is a dispute that goes past, let's say, December 14th. Um, and we have multiple slates of electors. We actually had this in 1876, where states actually sent sort of two sets of votes into Congress. Um, and then Congress has to decide which votes they're going to count. Uh, we have a law from, I think it's 1887, um, which governs how we handle that situation. It is a very poorly written law and everyone who looks at it is confused as to actually how it would operate. So if that happens, um, it's going to be a problem. Um, we basically hope and pray that's not the case, that we're not still talking about this, um, you know, in January, trying to figure this out. So, you know, I, I don't know what the probability is because I don't know how close this election is because I don't know how accurate the polls are. Um, okay. if, the, if the polls are accurate, um, then we will probably know on election night. Very good. Um, this next question kind of goes to um, what's in the news as well. How much of an impact do you think COVID is having on the election and will it favor one candidate over the other? Well, you know, COVID obviously is a major issue. Um, the, the problem with figuring out whether it favors one candidate or another is the American people themselves are very dis divided, um, particularly in the swing states on the proper response to COVID. Um, in Ohio, for example, we have a Republican governor um, Mike DeWine, former senator, who has been very aggressive about encouraging things like social distancing, um, encouraging mask use. Um, and his own political party um, has basically opposed him in the legislature on this. Um, you have people that are protesting against wearing masks in the United States. Um, so, you know, I think the American people aren't sure. Do they want to close down the economy? Don't they? Um, so in some ways for a politician, you can't win um, on this issue because if you're very aggressive um, in your stance against COVID saying we just have, you know, the most important thing is to save as many lives as we can and we need to shut down everything and not really worry about the economy um, with this. Well, that will get you some votes, but will also lose you some votes. Um, on the other side, if you don't take it seriously and say this is no big deal, um, when people see that the rates of hospitalization are increasing in the United States right now, and you know we're losing you know about eight to nine hundred people a day um, to COVID, well, again, that can cost you votes also. Um, I think the conventional wisdom is that COVID harms um, President Trump in his reelection campaign um, because he did not take it as seriously, or at least publicly, he did not take it as seriously as people thought he should have, um, you know, back in February or March. So he does, I think, suffer from that. But there are some voters who are more supportive of President Trump because of his attitude and because in part of the fact that not only did he catch COVID, but he defeated COVID, right? I mean, he, he survived it um, and, you know, appears to be very vigorous um, after having come down with COVID. So it cuts in a lot of, lot of different ways. Is it more important than the economy? It plays into the economic argument because in the United States, we've always said that the most important issue in any election is the economy. Um, James Carville, who was President Bill Clinton's advisor, was very famous for saying, it's the economy, stupid. Meaning, you know, if you're, if you're gonna win an election, um, you've gotta talk about the economy. Well, the economy was good in the United States, very good until about February of 2020 when COVID hit. So the other way that COVID, I think, damages President Trump is that it damaged the economy and made it harder for him to make the argument that he was going to make in 2020, which was reelect me because the economy is in great shape and I'm president when the economy is in great shape. Okay. The next question goes to the idea of a swing state. Um, and the question kind of goes to, to the idea of how does a state become a swing state or how does a, a state stop being a swing state? Is it have to do with the uh, economic circumstances um, and the changing of uh, sort of the economy of a state or is it broader demographic trends? How do you, how do you kind of explain what a swing state is and how it becomes one and how it stops being one? It's a very interesting question um, that I haven't really seen a lot of literature on. 
And honestly, to be frank with you, I haven't thought about it a lot myself. I mean, when we call a swing state a swing state, it's because the electorate seems fairly evenly divided, um, you know, 50-50. And, you know, that means that, you know, any candidate can win the election. Ohio is the classic swing state, right? Because Ohio, for example, voted for Barack Obama in 2008, voted for Barack Obama in 2012, and voted for Donald Trump in 2016. Um, in 2004, they had voted for George W. Bush. So they swing back and forth, right, between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Um, what's kind of interesting, and, and I, I, I really have to think about it, um, in the 1980s and even early 90s, um, California was considered a swing state. Um, California had Republican governors. Um, California sent Republicans to Congress. California is no longer a swing state. Um, is that because demographics in the state have changed? Is that because of Silicon Valley um, that emerged at the same time? Um, you know, I'm really, really not sure. Um, it, boy, it's really a fascinating question as to what makes a non -swing, a swing state become, um, or I'm sorry, a non-swing state become a swing state. Um, Texas, right, we might have a great study. And I think if Texas does become, let's say Texas votes for Joseph Biden in this election, it would be stunning. Um, if that were to happen. And I think we would all be looking at those demographic numbers and we would be saying, well, it's because of the increase in Hispanic voters. Um, there's also been a migration from California to Texas. Uh, people leaving California and going to Texas, but bringing maybe their more liberal political affiliation with them um, to that state and increasing the numbers. California is becoming an exporter of people. Uh, people are leaving the state for a lot of reasons. Um, including wildfires and things. So, um, you know, the states they're moving to, they're not necessarily changing their politics as they move to another state. And there's a lot of people in California. So maybe that can kind of make the difference. If California swings, there'll be a lot of discussion um, about, you know, what, 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 what makes it. I apologize. I don't think it's, I'm giving you the best answer to your question because I'm not sure what the right answer is. Um, it is an excellent question, a very interesting question. Good. Now, that was very helpful. Thank you. We are almost at six o'clock. I'm going to throw one more small, well, not small, but a brief question to you, and then we'll wrap up. I want to respect everybody's time. But just foreign influence on this election, Russia, China, Iran, any other country, is it happening? Is it going to matter? Should we just not pay attention to it? Um, well, you know, I'm not an intelligence expert, and I can't really, you know, speak, speak to that. I mean, you, you can read the newspapers in the United States. You have people with sort of different, you know, perspectives on that. Um, you know, what I will say is that there were reasons in 2016 beyond potential Russian interference in the election, um, which had Donald Trump win. Um, you know, in, in part because the message that he delivered, um, the anti-trade message, was a message that was popular in Ohio for a long time, um, pushed, by the way, by Democratic politicians you know, often at the time. So, um, you know, I kind of think I understand why voters supported Donald Trump in this area. Um, the message that he gave about tariffs and trade is something that I've been hearing here for 25 years. Um, and he took advantage of that message. So I don't think, you know, I've, I've been sort of flipping about this in, sometimes in interviews saying, you know, the average voter in Youngstown, Ohio did not vote for Donald Trump because Vladimir Putin told them to. Um, you know, they voted because they like what he said about trade. Um, so, you know, I, I will say that maybe we, we think about that a little bit too much, um, you know, in terms of whether it affects the election or not. Now, if, of course, we have a situation where we have actual, um, you know, interference with the computer programs, with things like that, actually, that, that would skew the actual voting, that would be a completely different matter. But the way we're talking about interference now is basically things on social media, Facebook posts, things like that you know, disinformation and things like that. Um, it's not clear how much that sways votes one way or the other, I think. I see. Well, I, I want to thank everyone who's participated, especially you, Paul, for taking the time. And it's extraordinary that you uh, are, are willing to do this as a, a service to uh, your fellow Americans and to our allies and friends overseas. It's so difficult to explain the American system because it's so complex. and. We think the best way to do it is to bring somebody who's outside the U.S. government, who's an, ex who's an expert in the U.S. government, to explain what everything is. And that's what we were just trying to do here today. So, uh, Paul, thank you so much. We appreciate it. I uh, see a lot of people who are giving you some virtual claps. Um, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that.
And I want to thank all the people who, who signed into uh, taking an hour out of your life. Uh, we hope this was useful to you. And we're going to give us a day or so. We're going to put this up on our website. Uh, you can get to it by Facebook or Twitter. If there are certain places you want to go back to, uh, you'll be able to access it online. And um, so that's all, I, that's all I really have to say is uh, thank you all. And uh, I wish you all well. Stay safe. And until the next time. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you all for listening. Thank you. You bet. Thank you.